Happy Sabbath, good people of Pleasant Valley Church. So glad that you've chosen to join us today. And I'm praying that this next hour will be a blessing to you and your family. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will speak to your hearts as Pastor George shares a homily. We've got some great music coming up. Um, there's another virtual choir that I think you're going to enjoy. There's a, there's a conversation with uh, Hannah Wachter and Jonathan Leonardo joining Pastor George and I. And I just am stoked about what's going to happen. So let's not delay any longer. Let's get right into it. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, church. The last few weeks have been heavy. Um, it's been rough. The world uh, is upside down and uh, just feels like there's chaos and unknown um, everywhere. And there's a lot of things going on um, that we want to be able to help with. And we want to be able to um, assist and help those that are oppressed. Um, there's disease and sickness all around. And I know for myself, I felt really helpless at times. Um, I felt frustrated at times. But what I've come to know, just spending time in the secret place in the morning is that for myself, I need to be grounded in Jesus Christ. And that is the start of the best thing that I can do for anyone, for myself, for my family, for my friends, and for those that need my help and those that um, I can be a blessing to. And so we're going to sing Build My Life. And I just pray that as, as we sing this song together, um, that these, these words really speak to our hearts and speak to Christ in a way that um, will allow us to just always remember who our foundation is and that each day, each, each morning, we can dedicate our lives and surrender um, our will to Jesus Christ as a way to be able to be closer to him and then be able to be used by him to bless others.
It is such a joy and a privilege to be able to gather together around the Word of God today. And I'm just so glad you're here, and, and we know that God has a blessing for us as we open His Word. Uh, we want to begin today by sharing a very familiar story, a story that you'll remember, a story about two sisters named Mary and Martha. And so I invite you to turn with me, if you have your Bible, but turn with me there to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to begin in verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him, that is Jesus, and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Hey, this is a, this is a, you know, it's a reasonable request. I mean, you think when Jesus shows up, he didn't travel alone. He's got at least has the 12 disciples along. And, and here's this situation where you've got all these people who've suddenly descended on your house. And, and here's Jesus, and he's beginning to share and teach. And, and Mary is sitting there and she is just hanging on every word. And, and here's Martha, who's, you know, distract, as the word says here, is that she's distracted with much serving. She had a lot of stuff on her mind, a lot of stuff to accomplish in a hurry. And you kind of look, I look at this story, I think this is a classic story. This is a, this is a classic kind of sibling sisters scenario where you've got the hyper responsible firstborn and she's out there getting it done. And then you have the, the free spirit who is the baby of the family. And, um, and she is just really, she's there catching the breeze, you know, and the sails and the, and sister's over there rowing away and she's just enjoying the, you know, this, the, the beauty of the day. And here's Mary digging in deep. It's not just the beauty of the day, but she's digging in deep to what Jesus is saying. And Martha, when she comes to Jesus, her expectation, you know, it's, a, it's an expectation that is shaped by the need of the moment as well as by the culture. But her expectation is Jesus is going to look at Mary and say, hey, girl. You know, you need to go help your sister. And that would fit perfectly because everybody knew that, that learning was for men only. I mean, even the synagogue at that time had a screen where you had the men sat before in front of that screen, and they were the ones who were engaged in the study of Torah. But you had the women who sat behind the screen, and there were conversations and so on happening back there. Uh, there was the, expect the expectation was learning is for men only, and the woman's place is in the kitchen. Sound familiar to anyone? Uh, so think about this in terms of what's going on. And here's Martha saying, come on, Jesus. So the question is, how will Jesus respond to this? What is he going to say? And Martha waits. And here, here's something, you could call this kind of a parenthetically, but think about this. Martha is talking to a man who fasted for 40 days. This is a man who fasted for 40 days as he sought his father, his father's presence and his will in his life. So for Jesus, and he even said there, I believe, was it the story of the, was it the story of the Samaritan woman where the disciples came back and said, hey, we got food. And he says, hey, I got some, I got food to eat you don't know about to do my father's will. So think about this as Martha's waiting for Jesus to answer. What will he say? And we now turn again to the text and we're in verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. Just hang on this for a moment. Jesus loves this family. He loves Martha. He loves Mary. He loves their brother Lazarus. This is a family that just, there is just this close personal bond and connection. And, and I hear it in the words of Jesus. He looks at Martha and he deeply cares for her. And he says, Martha, Martha. You are anxious and troubled about many things. He doesn't just go and 
do this kind of cultural kind of lizard. No, he cuts deep. He goes below the outer surface. He goes below the surface issues. And he goes deep to the heart. And he goes to the heart of the very issue in Martha's life. Is that Martha, Martha's trying to make the world work and get everything, all the ducks lined up in a row. And, and they, there's an anxiety about this. And there's an anxiousness. And, and she's troubled about it. And wanting to make everything right and make it. And Jesus is saying, look, Martha, you're focused on these many things. But there's something really significant happening here. The Son of God, you know, the, the one who in the beginning was with God, and the one who was God. This, this Jesus is sitting in your house. He's actually speaking the word of life in your living room. He's right here. And you're all focused and distracted in every direction about the many things. But, I love the next verse, verse 42, but one thing, one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken, which will not be taken away from her. So you see Jesus kind of laying out this contrast between being focused on the many things in order that we feel like to make our lives successful and to work. I mean, anybody here resonate with Martha on this one? And not just women I'm speaking. We're talking to men and women both here. Anybody focused all on the many things that it takes to make our lives work? And Jesus' word to Martha is a word to us as well. His word just goes right to our hearts. He just goes, hey, Martha. Hey, hey, George. You know, hey, Greg. You know, hey, hey, Ashok. I mean, whoever we are that's listening this day, you know, he's, he's just looking at us. He's saying, look, don't, don't spend your best energy on the many things. There's one thing that really matters, and Mary has chosen that one thing. It's interesting because I think, you know, the many things, serving that meal, that's a good thing. But in your living room is the best thing. And you remember that saying, you know, the, the challenge that we face is, is that the good is the enemy of the best. The good is the enemy of the best. And Jesus is inviting Martha. He's inviting us. He's inviting me and all of us. He's saying, look, I want you to choose the one thing. Make that the center of your life. So I want to ask you a question. What's the one thing in your life? What's the one thing? See, I know that you and I, we have all these many things in our lives. But what's your one thing? What's the most important? It's interesting. You remember this story when the, when the lawyer came up to Jesus and said, he said to Jesus, so uh, what's the most important command? What's, what's the first one? And you remember the words of Jesus. He just looks at me and says, love the Lord your God. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And he throws a little extra. It's kind of a, you know, he says, and the next one's a lot like it. He said, it flows right from it. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, your one thing is about love for God. And out of that love for God, to allow that love for God to not stay internalized in you, but then to flow out to those around you. That's your one thing, Jesus says. That's the one that matters most, to love God with all your heart. That's our one thing. Knowing that one thing and being committed to that is what enabled, if you think back to the heroes from the Old Testament and the stories of the Bible, that knowing that one thing and committing your life to that Allowed Daniel as a teenager. So teenagers, you know, young people, young adults, but even younger, you know, kids, whatever your age is, however old we are, here it is. We're being called, just like Daniel, just like Esther, just like Daniel's three friends, they stood because they knew the one thing. When you know the one thing and your life is centered in the one thing, that enables you to stand no matter which way the wind's blowing. You and I get to stand in the strength that is ours in Christ Jesus. So let's bring it right to today. You and I, you and I are being called to stand up for Jesus. To stand up for Jesus as strangers in a strange land. I'm thinking out here of Daniel and of Esther and of the three, his three friends. But here they were exiled to Babylon. Where do you think we live today? 
Who do you think our nation is? Well, those who are in Christ are part of the new Jerusalem. But the whole world is Babylon. Don't miss this. And we're being called to stand as strangers in a strange land to stand up for Jesus. To stand up, stand up for him. You say, okay, so where do I start? Where, where does this the whole thing begin for me? Remember another word of Jesus that uses the word one. And he said simply that uh, he's called us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the rest of this, all the many things will be added to us, those things of our lives. But number one, we are called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What's that mean for me? What does it mean for you? It means we start, you'll remember this book, but you, we start with a secret place. I had a conversation just yesterday with one of the members of our congregation, and she just said to me, she said, I'm telling you, it's just I've been torn in so many directions, everything that's happening around us, all the pain, uh, all, all of the hurt, everything that's gone on in, 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 our, in our country, and I'm just, and it's just, I've just gone back, I've gone back to the secret place to not be distracted by everything going around me, by all the circumstances out there, not to be distracted by the circumstances, to be centered, to be centered in Christ Jesus. When you and I do that, we take our stand on the chief cornerstone. It's then that we really are enabled to live this life in freedom to the praise of his glory. So, so okay, seek first the kingdom of God. So uh, what's, what's the key point in the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Well, the Apostle Paul speaks to us and again uses the first word. And here it is. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance. So seek first the kingdom of God. And the Apostle Paul now says, here's the, here's the issue that's of first importance for us, for those of us who are going to stand for Jesus as strangers in a strange land. Here is his word. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins, according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve, and he goes on to list all the many others, and finally he includes even himself. That is our foundation. This is the rock on which we stand. This is the chief cornerstone. Rejected by the builders, but the chief cornerstone chosen by God, our Father, that we stand on that stone, that this is our one thing. And as we live from this one thing, in this one thing and from this one thing, then you and I become part of his light in this world to bless our own families, to bless our neighborhood, to bless our city. Does our city ever need blessing? And to bring together those who say yes into the reality of the joy of our Lord that is ours in Christ Jesus. One thing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being the one who points out to us the one thing. It's you, Jesus. And Lord, we confess. I confess. I am distracted by many things. But I know I come alive. I come alive when I focus on you, my one thing. And on this day, together with my brothers and my sisters, I say yes to you. Jesus, you're the one thing. You're the one thing in my life. Thank you. We love you. We praise you. In the name of Christ, we pray this. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my soul. Oh
We have a lot of things to be thankful for uh, yeah. as, as individuals and collectively as a church family right now, don't we, Pastor George? We do. We do, uh, Pastor Greg. It's, uh, we, are, we are very blessed. I want to share with you, church family, that, that um, a, a word of thanks, a word of thanks as, as, as you, uh, you and we all together are, are trusting God through, through this thing. And uh, I want you to know that uh, we're meeting budget. Um, uh, giving has been up. We're just, we're just grateful, and and we know uh, our gratitude uh, is our our generosity. The uh, generosity that we show is a generosity that's responding to the generosity of the Lord uh, to us every single day, and the health that we enjoy, and all those pieces. Um, and speaking of health, I do I do want to say that we want to be lifting up as a church family. Mike Jones, who's recovering from a very significant surgery, and just please just lift him up and. And uh, his wife Diane, they uh, they covet your prayers, and we're just so blessed to have them part of this church family. And uh, and Carrie Nolster, who's home, uh, just continue to lift her up that that this recovery will go well, and that she'll be able to uh, be able to be able to walk uh, without pain and all those kind of pieces. We're just we're praying uh, God's blessing on you, Carrie. Um, you, we're lifting you up every day and together as a church family. And Judy and Judy. Uh, we're so glad you're home and you, you remain in our prayers as well. And we continue to pray for, for our nation um, and for, uh, we pray for the love of Christ uh, that, that will enable us as God's people to, uh, to love like Jesus loves and be part of his healing, uh, his healing touch and, and love in this nation. And so uh, we lift up our leaders, um, our president, our governor, our mayors, um, Every town, every every country, and, and and we pray that this this COVID will uh, be be held back, and that uh, God's people and the whole and the whole nation uh, will experience deliverance from this. So we give ourselves again to God and, and to His purpose. And uh, what a privilege to be the family of God together. Let's pray together. God, we just come to you uh, as your children. We thank you for your power and for your faithfulness, for your mercy, for the love that is at the core of everything that you are. And uh, so we worship you today. Um, thank you for your goodness and the ways that you pour it out into our lives. Thank you for Holy Spirit, that you pour your Holy Spirit into our lives, that we can daily experience your presence. And that's the ultimate rev revelation of your love and goodness. Lord, we... Um, We've just heard Pastor George has just shared um, some of the requests that that are that are on our hearts. We lift each one of those up to you uh, today. We mm. pray for healing for um, those who are in need. We pray for comfort. We pray uh, a continued um, blessing of restoration and healing for um, for those who have made so much progress over these months. And we're just Lord, we come to you today um, with hearts that are full of gratitude um, and also. Um, with with sober reflection it's we're we're in a difficult time in the history of our nation um and we 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 pray today for all those who are experiencing pain whether from loss uh for related to health issues and 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 COVID-19 but also for those who are who are who are experiencing pain 
um, because of uh, the events that have happened in this country uh, around injustice. And we pray for um, all those who are, who are in fear, all those who are grieving, um, even in times like this, just unexplained emotions uh, are a thing for so many people. And we, we just, we, we pray for your hand of comfort. We, we pray that we will have a right spirit led by your Holy Spirit, Lord, um, that each one of us would, would reflect on and, and that your spirit would speak into our hearts um, any area that we need to, that we need to repent, um, any area that we need to open up to you that, that we haven't previously. And may we, as the church, be united in demonstrating your love, in supporting others, in running to the ones who are experiencing pain and mm-hmm. sharing with them the love of Jesus. Amen. And so, Lord, we just thank you. And, and as we continue in worship, we just ask that you will open our hearts and minds. I thank you for, um, for what we're about to experience together in this conversation with, with Jonathan and Hannah. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would 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 be receptive to your Holy Spirit in, in these next moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a privilege for us to be together uh, here today with, uh, with friends, and actually I'll go further and say with family. Uh, I don't know that um, these two that Pastor George and I are here with need any introduction at Pleasant Valley, but I'm super happy to have Hannah Wachter uh, joining us for this conversation. And Hannah and her husband, Glenn, their kids are a part of our Pleasant Valley family. And Hannah, uh, we see you up front a lot for music and different things, but I've loved the conversations that we've had. I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, Jonathan Leonardo, you're like, uh, you're you're definitely part of the family at PVC as well. And so um, we're going to kick off this conversation just by, um, let's start with Revelation 7. There's a picture there of uh, the, the great multitude gathered around the throne, taken from every nation, kindred, tribe, and people. And um, it's a beautiful picture of of unity around the throne, unity of hearts and worship. And um, I love that image. And uh, yet sometimes it seems like it's uh, a long way from the reality that we find ourselves in here on earth and our context. And so today the goal is that we would have a conversation um, that would advance the kingdom of God and that would help us as brothers and sisters to understand one another, support one each other, each other. And so just glad to be here, a part of this conversation. Pastor George, uh, why don't you go ahead and kick it off for us? Well, I just want to give my greeting to Hannah and Jonathan as well. And these last, these last several weeks since Memorial Day, uh, the day that George Floyd, uh, his life was not lost, but it was taken from him, taken from him with a knee on his neck. And, and the, everything that has, the impact of that uh, on this nation and on each individual um, as I've thought about that and asking the question, God, where are you in all of this? Uh, it has been a blessing to me to be able to, to see some of the things that have been posted. I know, Hannah, there was something you shared that just jumped out at me when mm-hmm. soon after that you, you posted something about it, showed a picture of your brother there in his Marine uniform, but you, 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 you raised that question of, of the fear of what would happen uh, to your brother and to, to the children that you're raising. Mm-hmm. Um, just what, what has this been like for you these past several weeks? Oh man, um, it's been challenging. I mean, it's it's been heartbreaking. Um, I was texting with a, another PVC uh, member. His name is Travis, and he's in our in our Sabbath school class. But um, we were both uh, just talking about how we can't stop crying and how tears just come often and randomly. And I was just expressing like, I I feel like it's all this latent grief that is coming up to the surface. Um, And what I mean by that is um, as African-American people, as black people in America, we're always constantly processing our role in in society and in in different rooms with people. Um, I've also posted that, you know, when I walk into a room and I I always scan the room to see if I'm going to be the only one. Um, and I go through this whole emotional process that happens in just a few seconds, right? Of, of sizing up the room. Am I going to be isolated? Am I going to be the only one? Does this mean I have to be a representative for all of us? Like all of the things, right? And um, that's a heavy load to live with. And yet we live with it all the time, every day. And when things like happen with George Floyd, 
or Ahmad Arbery, what that does is it brings up to the surface all of the feelings that you're suppressing as an African American just to get through the day sometimes. And so when I posted that about my brothers, it was all this grief rushing to the surface. And yes, all this fear because um, I know that God is bigger than what's going on in our country, but it doesn't mean that he won't use it for his purposes. And um, I had said in the post that I would be a shadow of who I am if the men in my life, these beautiful black God-fearing men were murdered just because of the color of their skin and because of who God made them to be. God chose for them to be black men with brown, beautiful skin. And, um, and, and so I just wanted to humanize it. I wanted to put a face on it for all of my friends who follow me um, and know my brothers. These are the men that, you know, people are, are, are murdering. And, um, you know, my husband is white, you guys know that. And, but we have, we have two biracial sons, but when people look at our children, they don't see them as white boys, they see them as black boys. So, you know, there's, there's just a lot of <laughs> complexities about that. And um, I would say for me, like, I was, I, <laughs> fear won for a while with me for about a week and a half. And I was really struggling to find God, right? I was looking at the circumstances and the waves more than him. And um, I was able to finally find my footing, but yeah, there, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of grief when these things happen because um, you think we've made progress and, and it seems like we're right back there where we started, so. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. That, that, that's, that's a way that when you speak to that, it's a way I, that I don't, that I don't think typically in my own life. Um, I know when my, our oldest son first got his driver's license, um, I remember telling him, hey, if you ever get stopped, keep your hands on the steering wheel. Don't be reaching around. Just sit there, let him come, say yes, sir. Do I mean I gave him this, but I didn't think of it in the in the terms that you're speaking of it, in terms of that that other other layer in the history of uh, the way this has happened again and again, and uh, to and to, to walk into a room and not know how you'll be received because of the color of your skin. I, I think back to Martin Luther King and that that state. We know that to be judged by the content of a char our character, not the color of our skin, which is this ideal, this dream that we, that is, we say, yeah, that's what America's meant to be. Um, jo Jonathan, you've, you've been part of this. You've been uh, there, I, I believe, still in Chattanooga, Tennessee, through this whole, yeah. this, your, your thoughts, Jonathan, as, you're, as you've kind of processed the last several weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, a lot of commonality with Hannah, uh, Hannah and I are probably distinct in some ways in so much as that I don't have, um, a family and the interracial dynamic and in marriage that probably puts uh, a different spin on things. Uh, for me also, I had a really, really intense bout of reckoning with my racial identity about two years ago during the last uh, election cycle. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the racialized rhetoric. And by racialized, I mean a lot of the dog whistle politics that was present and latent in the back and forth in the last election cycle so that I came to a deep level of despair then that then was transmuted and transformed via the gospel so that presently what I'm experiencing is just the the, the frustration <clears throat> what emerges for me me individually presently is the frustration of having to make sense of things for people oh. and that's just the position that I'm in because of my capacity to do so but that you keep coming up against the same sort of resistance and that resistance is usually born out of a desire to want to see the world through the frame of equality and not have to interact with the atrocities of yesteryear that lead to the inequalities of today to kind of erase the past and move forward in a frame of equality but for us people of a darker hue it seems that this country the story that's being told about this country and continues to emerge over and over is that that uh, sort of intent or desire or impulse towards equality 
is not reality as it is. So for me to draw attention to the history of yesterday that frames the experiences of today are sometimes met with resistance. And from there, I'm a tad bit frustrated because it simply is just a reading of history, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you try to read history, that there's a deflection and denials and dismissals that you're like, listen, especially to white folk, like me, Jonathan Leonardo, I'm not making you complicit in some sort of sin from the past, but at least recognize that the sin of the past frames the inequality of today so that we can have some sort of fair ground to actually speak about the content of what we see before our eyes, as though what we see before our eyes rose up in a vacuum, as though mm -hmm. what we actually see in the American streets are because of the murder of George Floyd. What mm -hmm. we see in American streets is not because George Floyd was murdered. George Floyd's murder was the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were, and George Floyd's murder is one in a long list of injustices and atrocities that are part of the very fabric of this nation that we have to confront and look at and ask ourselves as a nation, ask ourselves, are we actually going to look at what our nation is intrinsically tied to, name it, call it out, and correct it? Or are we going to continue to say that that's in the past and let's move forward without acknowledging it? So framing the conversation in a broader sort of sense in order to include the weight of history and having it continually met with resistance is a tad bit frustrating because a good reading of just a couple of history books will correct any sort of resistance. And if the resistance continues after some reading of some history books, then that begins to concern me like, well, now it just seems as though a posture is being taken as to not yield anything for some other reason and that you know that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> can i can i jump in on that a little bit real quick too yes. i just i i just i just want to say amen like to that like what jonathan said he used a very pivotal word he used the word sins of the past and um you cannot found a country <laughs> on the backs of other people taken against their will from their home and think that these the consequences of that and abusing them and treating them as less than is not going to continue to show up and so one thing that i've been struck by this whole entire time is that you know this is this idea that we see even in scripture of like sins to the third and fourth generation like what we're he already said it like what we're seeing today is because of everything that's happened before and there's many more boys throughout history men throughout history who have been you know, brutally slaughtered because of their color of their skin. And that is a repeated thing that's happened, but that is because of the sins of the fathers in some way. So I, I just completely agree with Jonathan, like as an, as a nation, we have some real, um, we're having kind of an identity crisis. We have to really, we have to decide, we have to own what we did as a country. And I think until we're, we're able to do that and own our sin and really, and, and really repent of that, we're going to see the consequences of that sin continue to manifest itself in situations like George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, that, thank you for that, Hannah, too. Um, I want to, I want to say a couple things, uh, just, um, responding to, I think what I, what I have seen and heard from both of you. And uh, first of all, I want to come back to something Jonathan said. I, th I thought I saw agreement from Hannah, but, um, you, you, you referenced like the, the, the pressure or the, you didn't use that word, but of need being put into a situation where you need to translate or explain, or I, I would use the word educate. Um, and I realized that, um, you know, even this interview, this time that we're spending here talking is, is um, you guys taking yourself out of the emotion of all of the things that you've been thinking about and dealing with and, and, and coming together for the sake of, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christian unity, for the sake of the brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I just want to say thank you to both of you um, for the ways that you have patiently um, engaged in, in friendship with me. Uh, I know Pastor George has experienced this as well, but just like walking through these kinds of experience with authenticity and, and helping, I, I feel like that change happens one heart, one life at a time. And so thank you for consistently re-engaging, making the commitment to do that. And uh, I just wanted to thank both of you guys for that because I know it doesn't happen by accident. Mm. Oh, 
I want to come back to something that Jonathan said also. You, you referenced, Jonathan, um, a time back around the election, and you referenced the way that, that those, uh, that, that wrestling that you had done, that, that you were confronted by the gospel in some way during that, that you, I think you used the word trans, trans, did you say transmuted or, um, let's talk, let's talk about the gospel and what the experience of what you learned about the gospel or, or, or how that came to bear in this, in this, um, wrestling that you were doing, what broke through for you there? Uh, well, a couple of things I was, uh, it probably take too much to talk about the despair I felt right around that time, but that was coupled with me coming to the end of myself and my former understanding of all things religious and theological. So I came to that moment of conversion <clears throat> about four years ago last week, the first week of June 2016. And prior to that, I was really personally existing in deception and coupled on top of that, the sort of intense cauldron that was that time in our nation's history with uh, the rhetoric that was flying around during that election cycle, I was really pressed as a person. And on top of that, you add the sort of racial component. What the gospel did for me was that it really gave me a perspective to see correctly because I had been seen correctly so that I no longer framed my experience by needing somebody else to tell me I was okay. So that because of the gospel, I could experience a standing and identity of being okay and not having to live from offense, even though I could recognize offense, right? This is some of the, the middle ground that we constantly sort of lose that. And I hear people say that, well, Jonathan, how, how can you not live offended? Well, it's a choice that even though I feel an offense, I, like I said, feelings aren't Lord and we make every endeavor to not live from that feeling, but at the same time, recognizing the offense. So what has transpired for me as I come to the, conundrum and the dilemma that is race relations in America, I bring the gospel and righteousness to bear. But although I see injustice, although I see oppression, although I see um, ignorance in the technical sense where there's an absence of knowledge for people, that I can walk into that space and although I might feel something, I don't live from there. And that then hopefully I can speak into a situation and operate in relationship to a situation from righteousness, right? Not letting the injustices of yesteryear off the hook, but framing them correctly in order to serve my brothers and sisters and educate with the gift that I've been given. So what you just shared, Jonathan, as I, as I was listening to you speak, it just struck me that if that this is when you meant, and I think it was Hannah who mentioned, but just saying that the, the, the that what the nation is, where it is and the need for healing of the nation it, it really, it struck me as you were speaking, I was thinking, this is, this is the way that healing happens. Healing happens when, when we're called to the foot of the cross and there at the foot of the cross that we, we recognize and confess our own sins in this thing. And that, that, and that, and that process, then allowing the gospel to, to then place us in a different posture toward one another. And as I look at that, I'm thinking, wow, if this could happen in the church, then the church, we as the followers of Jesus could be part of the healing, even though I look back and go, for so long, the church has been shaped more by the culture than it has by the Christ, mm -hmm. by our Christ. Mm -hmm. by, shaped more by culture and caught in, 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 than in what Jesus has come in this radical transformation that comes through that death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can I can I share an anecdote that I think <laughs> that I think uh, that I think perfectly speaks to what Jonathan is talking about? When I was in the fourth grade, believe it or not, y'all, I was a crazy tomboy, and I used to play football all the time with the boys. And I tackled a boy, and he was embarrassed about it. And he was like really, really embarrassed, and so he got really mad at me, and he pushed me down, and he said, "Your skin is like dirt. You are dirt." you know, and he was like speaking all this hate over me and my skin and my brown skin and how dirty I was and how I can't wash it off and all this stuff. And I was crushed. Right. Um, and I went home and I was talking about it with my, with my mom and I was, you know, talking about my skin, like, am I dirty because I'm brown? Like I'm always brown and I can't get it off. Am I dirty? And she, I will never forget this. The only thing she said to me, Hannah, you are not, you are not dirty. You are made in the image of God. 
you are made in the image of God, is what she told me. She didn't say, no, you're black and you're beautiful. And I am, that's true. But the first thing she put on me, the first identity foremost that she put on me was that I was made in God's image. So no, there's nothing wrong with me. And I think that, you know, again, to what Jonathan is saying, um, even as a, as a black woman, as a black man, as, you know, as white men, we all need to, the first and foremost identity in the spot that we need to approach this situation from is as daughters and as sons of the Lord. So we are kings and queens in God's kingdom. And, and that's one of the reasons why, honestly, this conversation is super important to me because I've gotten asked to participate in a lot of other conversations, but this conversation here matters because this church matters to me. And I want everybody to know how we can grow together in this. But we first come from that posture that we are all made in God's image. He delights in us. And especially as those who have now are daughters and sons, that's the first place we need to come from in this, in this dialogue. And so, um, and I, I think that's just a really good antidote that speaks to what Jonathan is talking about with that mental shift. So for me, even though I've also felt despair, felt despair two years ago during the election cycle and those things, I'll tell you one thing that has not been taken from me is who I really am in Christ and that I am his daughter and therefore I am perfectly loved, perfectly seen, perfectly safe, but I bring glory to him just as he made me. Um, having that grounding is, is, is pivotal in these times. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Hannah. That, that's powerful. Um, I, I've been recently uh, reflecting again on the story of the woman at the well. And I look at what Jesus, what Jesus did there. Here's Jesus goes and he engages and, and breaks through several barriers. One is he speaks to a woman. Um, secondly, he speaks to a woman who is a Samaritan woman. And when his disciples come back from town, with it, they're, they're stunned. They cannot believe this is happening, that he's actually doing this. And I'm going to tell you the thought I had as I read it this time, I, and this is a thought I had not had before. But it struck me, and I thought, you know what Jesus was telling his disciples? He was saying, Samaritan lives matter. Mm -hmm. And that, for them, and knowing that they were the remnant people of God and, and the Samaritans were, you know, this, this group of people, this race and this, and the religiously as well as racially, they were just off the rails. They were, and here, here's Jesus speaking to them in a way. And then, then they stay there in that, in that city for several nights and, and engage there. And I thought, what a powerful picture of Jesus. And, and it struck me, thinking about this, it struck me that Jesus himself when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, he isn't called because he says he's the good who was the who was the neighbor, but he himself, Jesus himself, was the Good Samaritan. He is the Good Samaritan, and I, I love it that the picture at church when we get to get to go back there at PVC and and come into that, our sanctuary again and see that picture of that empty cross, and there's someone down there who's lifting up that man. Anyway, it just struck me that's who Jesus is, and that's who he's calling us. For us to love like Jesus loves, it's a call to follow in those footsteps. So these images that you're bringing up, Pastor George, are really helpful for us to think beyond the sort of myopic and limited lens of the gospel that American Christianity is trading in presently. So you hear rhetoric of, well, all we have to do is preach the gospel. And when we say things like that, it usually comes with a whole ideology that would limit the gospel to some interior experience of renouncing sin in our hearts so that we could treat our neighbor in the way that God has treated us. And that is to be sure. However, gospel language in the New Testament is highly political. What it is not, it is not partisan. So it doesn't participate in the partisan politics of the day, but it is theologically political. And so when Jesus is bringing the language of the kingdom to bear, he's undermining the systems of politics that exist in the world in order to bring attention to a whole nother politic that is coming because the politics of the system aren't enough. And so that the righteousness that he speaks of is to be manifested within these spaces of politic, right? Like 
racial relationships between Jew and Samaritan were deeply political. And when he brings the righteousness of the good Samaritan to bear and he identifies himself as the Samaritan, he is undermining a political construction that is rooted in highly partisan thinking. And so that when we talk about like all we need is the gospel, if by gospel you mean manifesting a righteousness that is actually kingdom minded because that's the politic we're about, then yes. But if by gospel you mean just doing away with my personal sin and having some sort of repentant experience with God privately so that I can look at my neighbor and feel at peace internally without actually living a life that manifests that righteousness in something like anti-racism, then that's a very limited, truncated view of the gospel. Precisely because the language of, say, Gentiles. When the Gentiles are included in the New Testament into the body of Christ, That's highly political. Why? Gentiles are a particular category of people that on the hierarchy of being in the Israelite mind are less than them because they're not the selected of God. So when Jesus appoints 12 men to actually preach the gospel within the nation and then selects Paul, the most learned, one would argue, of all of his disciples, right, in addition to the 12, and sends them to the nations. And then this Paul makes sense of what has happened in Christ by saying that the Gentiles have equal standing with Israel. This is a highly political idea that is upending every notion of the Israelite mind. And so when we bring to bear the truth of the gospel, we have to understand that it is highly political, but it's not partisan in a human way right? Yes. Uh, it, highly, uh, it highly undermines every notion that we have about how we're re- to relate to people, because it can't be limited to my interior life. It actually grabs my enemy in. It grabs that group of people that I believe are less than in, and it puts us on an equal footing. Not only does it put us on an equal footing, but it confronts my own notion that my majority culture is correct, and theirs is deviant. Because it's through the undermining of my own mindset that I come to see that my majority culture never had it right to begin with. And that his free grace has grafted others in because that's what his kingdom is about. So that when we come Mm -hmm. to this Mm -hmm. racial conversation, we have to understand that the New Testament is highly political, although it is not partisan in American Republican politics. So that Jesus is not a white Republican, nor is he a black Democrat. Jesus is not a liberal white Democrat or some conservative black conservative black republican he is completely something else with a complete different kingdom that is actually proclaiming that one jesus is lord and that we ought to act accordingly in all manner of life not just our interior religious experience yes yeah i love that and i think we could go in on that a little bit and say that the gospel liberates us to be able to say with him with in, in an emphatic way black lives matter and be able to say that in a way that aligns with kingdom values and that divorces itself from partisan politics and some of that Absolutely. ugliness that's around that. But, but to just to, to, to act and speak in accordance with gospel values, with kingdom values, that black lives absolutely matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it and, just, go yeah, ahead, and just, well, I just want to say too, and, and just because you say black lives matter, it doesn't take away from the fact that white lives matter or Samaritan lives matter or Jewish lives matter to the Lord. It doesn't take away. It's not an either or. It's not, a, it's, you know, it's not an exclusive statement. So I, I don't want people to get hung up on that either. It's a statement of running to where the hurt is. And that's mm-hmm. what Jesus does. He leaves right. the 99, goes to right. the one, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you put, you put mm-hmm. the need of that one above the majority. Because that is the one who has, who has the heartache, the crisis, is in crisis. So you take, you go after that one, you care for that one. But it doesn't make the 99 less special. Jonathan, go ahead. You were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that the, the, the New Testament takes highly political language and it reimagines it through gospel. So for instance, the notion of Caesar is Lord. That was rhetoric and slogan of the political ruling class of the Roman Empire. So when that uh, Christians came and said, Jesus is Lord, it was a political declaration that undermined the status quo. Uh, When we say something like Black Lives Matter, uh, we're drawing attention to the dignity of Black lives that the political status quo in the United States of America has historically not afforded to Black lives as a category, right? 
as a category, black people have not mattered in the same way that whites have. That's, that's just an, oh, there's an overabundance of evidence of this historically that we don't even have to get into, right? Not only slavery, but then during the reconstruction era, during the debt, pe yes. uh, debt peonage era, during Jim Crow era, and then during the last 30, 40 years, like this is historical. So that when we as Christians, if we make that declaration, we can make that declaration from a kingdom mindset. And like, let's be honest, as we're trading in that slogan, that slogan for the most part is not customarily viewed to be attached to one particular organization, even though there is an organization and it's a para organization. It's, right. it's, a, it's not a monolith, it's an organization that actually, it's a network that has grafted in like 40 other organizations mm -hmm. when we say Black Lives Matter. So that you can say it without running the risk of, uh, co-signing some sort of yes. political structure that you might or may not agree with like it's okay because yes. even even that that criticism of like black lives matter except i don't mean the organization that addendum <laughs> is again it's like for us black people we hear that and it's like man you you're saying that for white people you're saying that for other white people that might come at you and be like oh all lives matter and then there's resistance and hurt and contention and it's like hey man just like let it go it's okay like Black lives do matter. So do you. It's okay. Yes. You don't have to make all these extra affirmations. Like if somebody in your friend group is going to criticize you because you say black lives matter, your responsibility is not to make some sort of addendum to make them feel okay. Your responsibility is to call them out as to why they're not okay. Like why True. does this actually bother you? Because if True. it does, I got a story in the book of Galatians I want to tell you. Mm -hmm. Right? Like when Paul calls out Peter, like stop being a racist. Basically. Like it's okay if we say yes. Black Lives Matter and not have to add all this extra stuff. Of, well, not the political party. Like, come on. Come, come right. on, we know. You're just saying Black Lives Matter. It's okay. It's okay. Yep. Good. So, so, Jonathan, speaking of, thank you, speaking of Galatians, here we are. We're in Galatians 3, and I, this is a passage. Because when I look at this, and I've, I've heard the phrase before, that the church is the hope of the world. Now, I, I know, and you know, we know that Christ is the hope of the world, yes, but the church is meant to live out that love of Christ. Yes. But when I look at it and I say, okay, church, but here's, I love this passage. It's Galatians 3, 27, 28. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. Yeah. There is neither, here we go with the, polit you know, the political piece, but here there yes. is neither Jew nor Greek, yes. neither slave nor free, so yes. we're going from race, now we're going to class, and now there's neither male nor female. In, yes. So in terms of one sex or the other, he says, no, for we are all one yeah. in Christ Jesus. And I love the next verse. And if you are Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. Yeah. Of course, he's the one that got the promise, heirs according to the promise. The promise. Yeah. Through you, I'm going to bless every family on the face of the earth. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that needs to inform Yes, that has, that has to inform how we live out and approach the situation. We as the church, we have to be different in this because we are different. We are not, yes, yes. I just, I get so excited. I can't even handle it. Well, <laughs> so I can say something about that in Galatians 3, that then what happens there is that that, that new identity is undermining the boundary markers that would distance us from one another. It's not obliterating our identity. It's reconstituting it and reimagining it so that my Jewishness or my Greekness does not then become a boundary marker between you and I as much as it is an individual expression of the oneness we have in Christ. So Correct. you get to be Greek in Christ. I get to be Jew in Christ, but we're primarily in Christ, although we might have different expressions of what it looks like to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. What the challenge is, is for us to not see one another boundary because of race, as, we, as, as opposed to seeing one another as a beautiful expression of the fullness of what God is in our bodies. So that Hannah is a beautiful woman expressing the glory of God in her body that is hued a little darker than Greg's right. lighter hue. Or that I'm an expression of God's glory in my hue in the way that you're a different expression, George, in your hue. So that there isn't some value hierarchy of being, but that right. there is a continuum of a multiplicity of expressions of the oneness of that we have in Christ. 
so that when we come to have this race conversation, we have to first reckon with, well, we have to reckon, maybe not first or prior, prioritize, but we have to reckon that there has existed a hierarchy value, that a value of hierarchy where Correct. certain beings have been plotted in according to value. Like we have to reckon with that. We've done it in America and the uh, consequences of that plotting continue to affect us till today. We need to reckon with that. And once we reckon with that, we also need to be able to say, but we are actually individual expressions of the yes. multiplicity that is the one, right? Like yes. we are all here so that I don't lose my identity when I'm in Christ. My identity is firmly established and expressed and rooted in him, even as it looks like a black man, because it is. Right. And it's expressed all the more, expressed better. And, and these are beautiful things that, this just makes me want to worship the Lord, that he is so vast and creative. And it, it, it just stuns me that you, you know, you can be this black man and Greg can be this beautiful white bald man. And we can all, and you know, there's all these lovely expressions of color and race and ethnicity and tongue on this planet. And somehow they all come together as different expressions of God and we can all be in Christ and, and, and being in our, our, our created bodies as he made us as a black woman, as a white bald man, that we're bringing more glory to him when we're living from that space and we're really rooted in what's true, which is I am in Christ and nothing will take that from me. Mm. And I just, I really just want to affirm that, you know, as, as Jonathan has said, we have to live from that space. That's where we have to live from the, yes. the equality that is established in Christ. And that way we will be different and more people will be drawn to him. Like as a church, this is where we need to step up and, and show people like, so yes, I just want to, um, amen everything that Jonathan has said and he has articulated it very well. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be able to have this conversation with you and it, and it just gets me excited to see because God is, God is so creative and we all and bring might, him such glory. Amen. That, that could lead to some uncomfortable, uh, talks that could lead to some really like sincere vulnerable raw conversations as we navigate the complexity of race and identity within our bodies and in the history of our country and yet the primacy of our identity in christ is what allows that conversation to actually bring us into greater reconciliation Correct. So that in Christ, we don't just sweep it under the rug, but in Christ, we're able to have the dialogue from a place of identity and love, not only because we've been loved, but because we love one another. And we won't let the world's boundaries of what we're supposed to be actually limit us. We'll let our individual expressions unite us because we see Christ in one another. Mm, mm. So, so. The word that the phrase that spoke, jumped to my mind as you said that spoke that Jonathan was that we speak the truth in love. Yeah. But we speak the truth. I speak the truth. And sometimes we want to go either or there. But we speak the truth in love. Yeah. Yeah. And this conversation is just the beginning. Yeah. It's just the beginning. And mm -hmm. I, I'm with you, Hannah. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to see what God, what he's already doing, but what he's going to do in ways that we haven't even imagined yet in terms mm -hmm. of lifting up the love of Christ in this world. Hannah, would you, would you please pray for us as we, as we close this? Yes, it would be my delight. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I just thank you so much for being here with us. I thank you so much for how you have made us in your image, exactly as you wanted us to be, exactly as you designed and intended us. You knit us together in your mother's womb. You have made us all various shades and it brings glory to you. And I'm grateful for that. God, I am thankful for Pleasant Valley Church that has a heart to hear. We have experienced really hard weeks um, these past few weeks. And right now the posture of listening is so powerful. And so I'm grateful for our community that wants to listen to one another. And I just pray that we would listen with the mind of Christ and that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to obey what we need to do next. And I just thank you for my brothers here on this call, 
and their love for you and the way that they lift me up as a, as a daughter of God. And I just thank you for their sonship in you, Lord Jesus. And I pray for every single daughter and son of the PBC community and people who are watching this, that they would walk um, in your love and in their true identity um, as, as your children. So thank you. We love you. And we give you all the glory and we trust you. We know you're working in this. In our most holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.